Welcome to our inaugural episode of the More XR Insights podcast. It's the latest in everything from augmented reality to virtual reality and everything in between. And it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Anshul Sog, More Insights and Strategy Senior Analyst covering XR, 5G, smartphones, and PCs. And let's get started. This week, we will have three guests on the podcast in a panel format to talk about the latest developments in VR centered around foveated rendering with Toby's Johan Helpfist, NVIDIA's David Weinstein, and HP's Henry Wang. So let's get started with the first questions. Um, first, I'll have you guys introduce yourselves. So please uh, introduce yourselves. Yeah, so I'm uh, Johan Helpfist. I'm working at Toby. We do eye tracking and I'm heading up the XR segment within Toby, focusing on integrating eye tracking into devices. I'm Dave Weinstein. I'm Director of Virtual and Augmented Reality here at NVIDIA. Henry Wong, I work at the VR group in HP, and I'm Product Manager of the HP Reverb G2 OmniCept Edition headset, which is launching uh, next month. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, so I guess we can start out with kind of a, a level set, and I'd ask, where is eye tracking today versus a few years ago, or even where was it before it was implemented in VR? And I'll, I'll start with Johan, but I'd love to hear from all of you. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think if we look on, on, on eye tracking in VR a few years back and even stepping a little bit further back, uh, historically, uh, eye tracking has been around for more than 20 years in, in modern format, uh, starting out in scientific usages and assistive usages. Uh, when we started in, in VR, we also came from the scientist, scientific field where you had a selected group of people who could kind of do eye tracking. Uh, 2018, we kind of launched our first commercial headset for, for OEMs. And the main focus we put in there was for it to work on, on, on many people uh, and have a good enough uh, um, accuracy and precision uh, from, from the eye tracking point. What has happened the last year is that we have continued that route. We, we see that the more we moving from establishing ourselves in enterprise and moving into consumer, the more you need to guarantee that it works for everyone, which is, it's, it's relatively easy to make a simple eye tracker. It's darn hard to make one that works for, for, for everyone. And we also released a couple of headsets. The most recent one is uh, with, with HP, the Omnicept edition, which we're really, really thrilled about. And uh, beyond the eye tracking part, we also kind of work with, with partners, NVIDIA here, for example, to lower the barriers using eye tracking and, and showing the real benefits of eye tracking moving along. And, and I think we've made huge steps just the last three, two, three years. And, and we assume, assuming that we will con continue that trajectory. Yeah, and I think to add on to what Johan's saying, I think where the market is in terms of expectations and customers, are really aligning with how the technology is progressing. You know, when we first talked about VR, you know, a couple of years ago, it was always about the promise that VR, or that eye tracking could bring to VR experiences. Um, but last, late last year, when we launched the, uh, the standard Reverb G2 headset, um, you know, we would be talking to customers and the whole pitch around the Reverb G2 would be barely out of our mouths and before the customer would just interrupt us and say, okay, that's great. That's super exciting. When's the eye tracking version coming? <laughs> um, you know, there's almost this expectation that eye tracking is here and has truly arrived. And that I think that is what, exactly what we're seeing now with the, uh, with the launch of our OmniSupt edition of the headset. I think one of the, um, just to chime in on that, you know, one of the exciting things about eye tracking uh, inside of a VR headset is um, it really starts to, to differentiate VR rendering from uh, traditional monitor rendering. You know, if we, if we go back a few years, um, the VR headsets were basically, you know, take a monitor display, shrink it down, you know, take a couple of them and, and cool, we have, we have VR. But there's so much opportunity to, to differentiate it. Like that made sense as a starting point because that was the graphics pipeline that we had. But when you really think about um, graphics and uh, what you want to show to a person who has a VR headset on, um, you could render a ton of pixels, 
But in reality, they're only seeing a very, very small percentage of those pixels, right? And so this concept of, of eye tracking um, kind of turns the graphics pipeline on its head. It says, don't render the entire screen you know, equally. There's no reason to do that. That's, that's a waste. Instead, there's all these optimizations. There's all these things that we can, that what we can do when we make computing more personalized. And the VR headset is just a perfect example of that. So you know, over the course of this discussion, uh, um, hopefully we'll have time to talk about it a little bit, but you know, ray tracing is, um, is the right technology if you know where a person is looking, right? And so again, it's kind of reimagining uh, the whole graphics pipeline and, and uh, gaze tracking is really the, the first step in that. Great, uh, I guess that tees me up for the next question, which is, what are the key technologies that have enabled the advances that we're seeing today versus what was possible in the past? So if I'm um, on the eye tracking side, um, we, we see that as, as David were alluding to that, that doing, using eye tracking to kind of optimize where you focus your graphic resources on uh, is where we have spent uh, a lot of, of time investigating. I know that NVIDIA has been doing that for quite some time. When it's come to the eye tracking part, our, I was saying before that it's, it's need to cover a full population. Um, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that we've seen that the characteristics of eye tracking signals when you do foveation is slightly different when, when you're, you're <clears throat> using uh, interaction, for example. Uh, with, with, with infoviation, it's extremely important that you actually are hitting the area where you want to optimize your graphics and you want to do that all the time consistently. So we actually have a different signal and different, and different concept around eye tracking, uh, even feeding like in, in, in the VRSS case, uh, the signal directly to the, to the driver, uh, to the NVIDIA driver. Uh, and we've separated those signals for those reasons because they're optimized in, in, in different ways. And we call that Toby Spotlight uh, when we've optimized uh, that portion. And uh, I, think, I think those two in combination are the main uh, events that has kind of enabled uh, foveation to be really as good as it is right now with, with, with the VRSS2 and, and the, the coming headsets. So that's, that's the key drivers, I think, for, from an eye tracking perspective. David? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a ton of technologies that, that uh, come to play here. In terms of the, the actual eye tracking, um, I think Johan covered it really well. You know, the, the next step then is, um, cool, I've tracked the eyes, now what do I do with it, right? And that's, that's when these technologies like um, uh, variable rate shading uh, really come into play because as I was mentioning before, if you know where the user is looking, uh, um, you know, suddenly it's a different ballgame. Suddenly your, your rendering problem isn't uh, render as many polygons as you can, as fast as you can and make them all look gorgeous. Suddenly it's make the portion of the screen that the user is looking at or that they care about um, look gorgeous and the rest of it just has to be good enough, right? So, so uh, VRS is, um, you know, technology that we'll, we'll talk more about later in the segment, but just to kind of lay the, uh, the foundation for it, the, um, the whole concept, so VRS stands for variable rate shading, right? And it's an industry standard. Um, NVIDIA first, first added support for it, first implemented it uh, with our Turing architecture, so previous generation. Um, but the whole idea is let's take the screen and break it up into 16 by 16 pixel blocks, right? So if you have a whatever 4K by, you can imagine, you know, you have a pretty fine tessellation of these blocks. And for each of those blocks, I'm going to specify uh, um, the shading rate that I want to use uh, within, within that block. And so this gives you really fine grain control over where you're gonna spend your rendering resources. And on top of that, you know, there's all sorts of great technologies that you can build, such as VRSS that we'll, we'll get into. Perfect. Um, I guess the other question, and this one's a little bit more uh, focused directly at Henry, which is what are some of the challenges of building next gen high resolution VR headsets like the Omnicept that are, are kind of pertinent to 
this discussion around foveated rendering. Yeah, I think everything that Johan and David talked about um, is certainly certainly exciting. And what really helps it stand out is coalescing that with a headset um, or providing that headset that really brings puts those in in the spotlight, so to speak. It really puts those at the forefront and, and makes those benefits shine. Um, and if you've looked at our progression within HP in terms of our headset portfolio, moving from Reverb Gen 1 to Reverb Gen 2, you know, one of the things that'll stand out immediately is from Gen 1 to Gen 2 on a pure pixel count, that didn't change. It's still 2160 by 2160 per eye. It's still <clears throat> that, you know, very high industry leading um, resolution amongst major headsets. But it's because at that pixel density, we've really solved a good amount of that, what people perceive as a screen door effect. But then with Reverb Gen 2, if you actually put it on and do a side-by-side -side comparison of Gen 2 versus Gen 1, you'll notice immediately that <clears throat> despite it having the same resolution, the visual experience is much improved. And that's because with Gen 2, we work closely with our partners at Valve and Microsoft to really look at what are the other aspects of the visual experience that we can bring to bear and, and improve? Um, particularly, you know, with our relationship with Valve, them bringing expertise in optics and improved lenses really helps with the clarity so that, yes, you're getting a high pixel density, but you're also viewing those through lenses that do justice. Um, <clears throat> and then what that enables then to move from Reverb G2 to Reverb G2 OmniSept Edition is for the focus to then turn to the rendering pipeline, you know, to what David talked about with VRS and VRSS, uh, what Johan's talking about with Toby Spotlight, um, and to improve the rendering pipeline as well, so that from you know kind of the, the the top of the stack with the application all the way down to you know the headset level and and the components, the displays, the optics in the headset, we're really seeing a full kind of holistic improvement um, across that entire stack. Um, so that that's really what we're seeing here uh, with all of these different elements coming together in, um, in, in the Reverb G2 on the sub edition. Yeah, and you mentioned VRSS 2.0. Uh, I was kind of curious, like maybe David can answer this. How does VRSS 2.0 work and what are the underlying technologies and how is it different from VRS? I'm so glad you asked that, Angel. So, um, <laughs> So uh, I'm going to put on my professor hat for a second and, and sort of walk you through what VRSS is um, and uh, kind of how two is different than one. And I think that'll answer your question. So I mentioned earlier on that, you know, VRS, um, variable rate shading is kind of this core underlying technology. And then there's all sorts of things that you can, you can build on top of that. Um, so what, what NVIDIA uh, had noticed after we published our VRS SDK and we were encouraging developers to use it, is um, there are a lot of developers, you know, everybody who's building a VR application is on a, um, a tight budget in terms of um, time to, to, to bring out their new game, their new app. And so they don't always have time to, uh, to invest in, in new technologies. Um, ultimately, they do when, when they see how great they are, uh, but, um, you know, anything that's going to slow down the process is, uh, um, is going to be a challenge. And so um, what we did with VRSS is we said, uh, we know that you will see improvement in your, in your game quality and your visual quality um, by using variable rate super sampling. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to make that available to developers as a zero coding solution. In other words, you already have an application, you've already built your app, it's already been released we can still make it run better with higher image quality. And the way that we did that was inside of the driver. So developer didn't have to do anything. Inside of the driver, um, if you have headroom, okay, so uh, a, a VR frame has a budget of roughly 11 milliseconds, right? 90 frames per second. So let's say that you completed rendering that frame in nine milliseconds. You have two milliseconds left. 
And there's no advantage to um, sending that frame to the headset early. It's not gonna do anything with it. So let's take those two milliseconds and improve the visual quality uh, in, in a specific region within that image. And with VRSS, we said, we'll do it right in the middle of the image. And so we basically take a circle and uh, users tend to look forward in VR and we improve the image quality, again, using that VRS technology. So in the driver, we um, create a, a VRS grid and we say in the region in the middle, we're gonna do a higher sampling rate, right? And so we released that with uh, um, a little over a year ago, year and a half ago, um, and that was called VRSS. It was VRSS version one. And, um, and people loved it. It got uh, adopted by a bunch of games. Um, of course, they love it. Developers don't have to do anything. Users just see the benefit of it. Um, the problem with it is people aren't only looking straight forward inside of VR, right? Y yes, you turn your head a lot, but you also you know, move your eyes around. And so um, a better optimization is let's improve the visual quality where the user is actually looking but that requires gaze tracking, right? And that's, um, that's where this whole partnership came from, uh, working with, with Toby, because there needs to be this tight coupling between the, um, the gaze tracking hardware and, and libraries, and then the driver, which is gonna have to receive that information. Uh, and then of course, a headset that would take advantage of it, right? So that's, you're seeing the pieces to come together here. So with VRSS2, um, that was the, the further optimization that we made. So in real time, we're receiving this gaze tracking information and we're using that in order to, um, to build the VRS map, which in increases the image quality uh, in that portion of the region of the image where the user's look. So, so maybe I can take one step back uh, <clears throat> uh, on, on what is kind of foveation. I mean, if you have your visual system, your eyes, it's actually a relatively crappy system from a sensor perspective. You only have focus on your thumb where you have a high resolution focus. The further you move out, the lower the resolution and when you are in the periphery, it's actually black and white. So uh, the, the, the impression that you get that you have perfect vision all over it's just a brain construct it's it's your brain kind of interpolating where you're looking and the same method is used for 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 graphics or it could be kind of where the user have focus you can do optimization in this case we we do graphics optimization i think uh you when you measure an eye tracker you you tracking you can't be pixel accurate there's it's a sensor system that absorbs you uh the uh, the better it is, the sh smaller the area can be, the larger the saving. The shorter the latency, the more you can shrink that area as well. So we've been working very much to get that consistent uh, and, and deterministic with a very short latency. That's also, as, as David were alluding to, we are, we are connecting directly into the driver to kind of tuck every kind of latency and, and uh, the signal will get used uh, as late as possible in the rendering pipeline to add a little latency from when I'm actually looking to where it actually gets rendered. Uh, and that is kind of a concept that is, that is fundamental to any foveation. So now we're looking at VRSS and there's future things that we can do as well. And when you have a headset like the Omnicept edition, you also are very sensitive that if you only do it in the middle, if it's static, are you wasting all your nice optics that you, you, you acquired for a lot of money? Uh, and you want to have absolutely the best performance per pixel. And you want to be look around like you do in reality. And that's why, why, why I think this is, this is a great marriage now, a three-party marriage. But, but, uh, and it's actually now starting to work better and better. VRS worked, and this is working even better. So I think it's a, it's a great progress moving forward. And you mentioned ray tracing. That will also be interesting. Yeah, you make you make a really good point, and I'm glad you brought that up, Johan. Um, you know, as you, uh, um, I think it's it's useful. Uh, you know, people have a good picture in their head now, thanks to your explanation, that you know where you're looking. You know, the size of your thumb is is sort of the the foveated region. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned that that VRS is going to increase the image quality. Um, 
maybe just double clicking on that for a second, you know, what you notice within that VRS region, if you were to pause the, the screen and look at, you know, what's the fidelity outside of that region, um, you'll notice that within that, uh, that super sample, that VRS region, um, you can read text much more clearly. Uh, um, you're essentially super sampling, right? You're super sampling within that circle. Uh, and so everything becomes clearer there. Your, your materials uh, um, have much better accuracy. Um, you, you have much, uh, you get away from sort of flickering artifacts and aliasing. You're able to read text. Um, and, you know, as you were saying, uh, you're, you're nearly blind in your periphery. So, it, you know, it would be a waste to be doing all of that super sampling work, you know, out in those regions. I think there's a couple of nice pictures and, and small movies that we've that you that we can publish as well. Yeah, we will have some of those queued up. You can watch uh, during the video podcast if you want to uh, tune into that. But uh, the audio podcast, uh, unfortunately, doesn't have visuals. It looks great. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, did you have any insight or uh, did, did you want to move to the next question? Well, I think something that I would like to reiterate, you know, that, you know, David mentioned um, kind of at the start of this, uh, this topic was the fact that VRSS is now available without any additional coding necessary on the developer part that really can't be the importance of that can't be overstated. Because right? if you think of VR developers these days, you know, they are you know, often lead, often they, they are looking at them, their resources and their bandwidth, um, you know, what can they do? They have new applications to create or existing ones to update. Um, and as they're sorting all these out, to be able to deliver all these great benefits that Johan and David talked about without any, you know, really additional work on their part is, is huge for the adoption of the technology. And really that'll, you know, filter down to the end user and more as more end users see the benefit, it kind of creates this, this feedback loop, right? Where as more end users see it, they start to expect that more and more and they are asking for that from developers and for a developer to look at that and say, well, this takes no additional work. Well, that's a no brainer. Of course, I'm gonna make sure that it, it works with VRSS. Um, that that's only going to improve VR experiences everywhere. Yeah, so it might be worth taking. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Henry. It might be worth taking 30 seconds just to mention that um, there is uh, it's no coding, zero coding, as you said. Um, uh, but there is a, a, a process. We want to make sure that VRSS um, does work great with those apps. And so um, developers just need to um, you know, pick up the phone and call us basically. So send us the app, we'll double check it, make sure that it uh, is seeing the image quality benefits that we um, expect it will. And then uh, we just add that to, to the allow list and the driver. Um, and then users can just turn on on kind of a you know, per application, they can just go turn on the application in the NVIDIA control panel to, uh, to then take advantage of those settings. Um, the application does need to be uh, DX11 and forward rendered, which um, most VR applications are. Um, and then, uh, of course, it has to have a MSAA buffer because that's what we're going to use for the super sampling. But yeah, super easy. Cool. Thanks for the explainer. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> HP's new Omnicept is the first headset to integrate a lot of new sensors and capabilities. And how does foveated rendering make it different from the standard Reverb G2 from last year, or well, from this year, I guess. And what are some of the applications that you guys can think of that, that make sense for this new headset? Yeah, so, you know, I think Johan and David talked a lot about, you know, how foveated rendering works, how it really optimizes around how a human visual system works, you know, and, you know, I think when you look at the effect that has on the visual experience, you know, going back to you know, what, I, what I talked about earlier in terms of where we went from Reverb G1 to G2 and then now G2 to the G2 Omnicept edition and taking that a step further and, and making sure all of the improvements in Gen 2 um, visually are accentuated even further, 
Um, you know, I think what we're seeing is for a commercial oriented device like the Reverb G2 Omni Sub Edition, you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of use cases like product design and AEC where um, the absolute accuracy and detail really, really matters, um, as well as training uh, that has, you know, fine text and detail. Um, you know, a lot of these use cases uh, where you're training, say, on a, um, a, if you're a maintenance technician training on a new piece of equipment, you know, a lot of times text um, labels and such are a big part of that training experience or a big part of the usage of equipment. And so to be able to really make those finer details come out even more, um, super valuable. And it really plays well, of course, with the insights that eye tracking, as well as the other sensors on the Omni Sept Edition headset, like heart rate and, um, and face camera bring to the table. So uh, those are kind of the use cases where we're really seeing this have, have an impact um, and really super excited to see what developers do with all of that. And I think one more thing, I mean, we're talking VRSS2, which is the focus here, which kind of enhances textures and, and text. I think if you if you have an application and you want to really utilize the graphics in the in the Omnicept edition, you could all but you still don't have enough uh, frame rate or you don't have enough uh, graphic uh, uh, performance. Then, if you have a little bit more 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 development time, you can actually use VRS, which is kind of downsampling and focusing your full graphical power on where you want. So that's 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 the beauty of this concept of of, of that Nvidia has that it's either you have no coding and you just enhance, or you do a little bit of coding, and then you can get even more horsepowers out of what you need to kind of make your application absolutely brilliant. And it's the same concept, but, but you, you need to, to, to add a little bit of work on, on, on your application. Whereas VRSS is kind of no coding, just go contact David, not maybe directly, but uh, NVIDIA and get it, get it done. And then you run it on your, on your HP device. That's a good point. What, one of the things that we've seen people do when they um, take advantage of the, the full power of VRS is that in addition to um, foveation, which uh, you know obviously you can you can still do foveated rendering um, with with full blown VRS, um, people uh, are also using it to do what's called content adaptive shading. Um, so if I have objects in the in the periphery that have a high frequency texture on them, like um, maybe the carbon fiber uh, um, of the hood of a car. Um, what you'll see with um, sort of normal rendering is you can get some flickering and popping out in the, out in the periphery where that car hood is. And so with full blown VRS, um, you, can, you can say, okay, for that texture, for that material, wherever it shows up in my scene, I want to super sample. And where the user is looking, I want to super sample. Oh, and I want to take advantage of the fact that I kind of know how the optics work in my head mounted display. And so you can really kind of fine tune it in, um, you know, if you, uh, if you um, have the budget to take advantage of, of all that VRS offers. Cool. And I guess that kind of leads us into more questions about the Omnicept specifically, um, kind of around the Omnicept sensors and the SDK. And how do you guys see the new Omnicept SDK changing the way VR moves forward? I kind of want to start with Henry, just because he's the expert on the headset. Yeah, so, you know, virtual reality is already being valued greatly um, in a whole host of use cases, a whole spectrum of industries for its immersion, for that immersive experiences and the impact that has in these use cases in training, collaboration, product design, et cetera. Um, but the vision around Omnicept is to really push that a step further and make v experiences uh, user-centric. So how can you improve both the experience while you're in the HMD as well as the outcomes um, by adding inputs? and adding insights. So, you know, the Omnicept edition of the Reverb G2 has, of course, eye tracking, uh, but as it also supports uh, pupillometry with those same sensors, as well as a has a PPG sensor that can measure heart rate. 
um, and then as well as a face camera that looks at the mouth and lower facial area. Um, but really what those mean for the end user is having insights from eye tracking, as well as the Omnicept SDK, having the capability to collate all these different sensor inputs into a machine learning driven cognitive load insight. So you understand how cognitively loaded is a user during experience at different points in the experience. Um, because if you think of a lot of these use cases where for VR, whether that's design review, whether that's training and simulation, you know, the VR experience isn't just limited to within the headset. Um, certainly, you, while you can change the experience within the headset to adapt to how a user is responding to that, it also extends to after the VR experience. So a, say if it's a training example, um, having an after action review where you're looking at, okay, at what points in this procedure that you're training on, did you react in a certain way? And how does that need to be tweaked? How does that need to be you know, fixed for the next, uh, next training rep? You know, to be able to have that active feedback loop that, and with all these extra inputs um, really has a direct tangible benefit of these user insights. Um, enabling expressivity down the road with both the eye tracking as well as a face camera really enables collaborative experiences to become more engaging, uh, more, you know, well, collaborative <clears throat> as collaboration is really coming to the forefront, especially, you know, kind of in this COVID environment where we, we live in where a lot of things are moving to virtual. Um, so being able to really bring these tangible benefits of user insights, but then also setting a precedence in terms of security and privacy um, with how the how the, the user insights are handled and how they're being utilized, how they're being stored or not, right? Um, that's also a key pillar of OmniSept and the OmniSept SDK. Uh, so really about, it's all about adding more insights into it and to go back to uh, one of the things David was talking about earlier in terms of how VR is really transforming in terms of it's going from just displays in front of the user's eyes. Um, it's all about making that kind of a more full-fledged suite of inputs and then the VR experience um, adapts based on these inputs, more so than just pure headset tracking, more than just controller tracking. It's also these other um, physiological inputs as well. Yeah, I think your training and simulation example is a very good example, because if you are a hazardous uh, environment under stress, for example, you may be working with tools and with, uh, with the Omnicept edition with eye tracking, you can kind of, okay, my hands are occupied, but I can still kind of select things with my eyes to kind of interact with the application. You may have a guider, a guide or a trainer telling you, no, 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 don't look that much to the right. You should look more to the, to the, to the left, to the center of the fire. Uh, at the same time, you can measure the cognitive load of that person, how stressed out is that person. And in aftermath, you can see, okay, did I actually look at the right stuff? Did I, did I pay attention to, 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 to what I was supposed to? Did I pay attention to uh, if something was happening uh, at the right place? So I think you, you have all those three kind of pillars of interacting, uh, how, to, how to do proper insight, how to measure the stress level, and provide fantastic graphics with some foveation. Yeah, I really like the, the term that Henry used of user-centric um, you know, experiences, user-centric computing. Uh, you know, the, the promise of VR is that it will bring us all closer together, right? We don't have to physically be in the same space, um, but we can, uh, you know, through VR, we can feel like we're in the same space. But what we saw with the first, you know, the beginnings of VR was pretty isolating, right? You put on your VR headset and now, you know, you are completely separated from, from the physical world. And so the, this promise of, um, you know, going, uh, having the pendulum swing fully back the other direction, um, I think is great. And I agree. I think that, you know, anytime that, that you're in a training situation, anytime that, you know, in real life, you would imagine having a, a mentor or a supervisor there, um, having all of these sensors uh, is super, super important. 
because the mentor or the trainer who's there with you is kind of keeping an eye on you. They're seeing how you're doing. They're really kind of tracking your performance and trying to get those insights and having all those sensors um, provides that data. There's a really good deep learning problem of how do I take all of that data uh, and then you know, turn that into a stream that, uh, that an, an intelligent agent can then you know, act upon. Um, but we're good at deep learning, you know, we're, we're not afraid of that. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, the promise of, of VR bringing us together, allowing us to collaborate really hinges on having um, more and more sensors in these headsets, uh, the, the mouth cam to, to measure, you know, smiling and expression and um, all the different eye cameras and engagement. And, um, you know, that's what, what's going to make it feel like we're together is, is all those sensors. That's great. I, I really appreciate it. I, I think um, this has been a, a very interesting time for our industry because I don't think we've really ever had uh, as much focus on the user as we have today, thanks to all the new types of sensors and software that's enabling it from all different angles. So I, I think it's great. And, and that kind of leads me into um, expanding some of these capabilities outside of a, you know, PC experience, um, specifically PC VR, um, where, what ways that VRSS and foveation could necessarily be used outside of a PC VR headset. I'd love to hear where that could be going today. I'll take, I'll take a first stab at it. And then uh, um, I know Johan has, has some to add. So one of the trends that we're, we're all seeing in, in computing is, um, people are moving more and more of their uh, compute, which can be VR experiences, could be anything into the cloud, right? And that makes a ton of sense. Uh, you know, having, having compute on demand as much as you need, when you need it, um, is, just a, is just a fantastic promise. Um, it brings with it some huge challenges for VR, right? VR and AR are very latency sensitive. It cannot be the case that, you know, that I can wait 200 milliseconds for my image to come back, right? I, um, we all know that you, know, you, you roughly have 20 milliseconds for motion to photon latency from the time that I start moving my head to the time that the image has to update. And so um, while, uh, while VR is now taking hold, it's, it's um, at first blush a little bit uh, incompatible with this idea of pushing more and more of our compute to the cloud. Um, until you recognize uh, some of these, these opportunities that we have that, um, uh, that Johan and others were referring to earlier, you know, if, we, if we take advantage of the human visual system and um, the fact that, yes, I have to update the photons very quickly, but those photons don't have to be exactly right. It's just that the world needs to move, right? And, um, and uh, similarly, um, if you kind of dissect the graphics pipeline, there are things that you can do in the cloud, like indirect global illumination, that no one notices if it takes 200 milliseconds for global illumination to update. Um, so dissect that graphics pipeline, put things that have to happen very quickly with low latency, very close to the headset, um, and, and you have a, a, a winning uh, strategy. And that's, um, you know, that's what we're doing with, with Cloud XR, which is NVIDIA's XR streaming uh, SDK. So we do the rendering in the cloud. Um, we do some uh, um, uh, small amount of rendering locally on the headset so that uh, we can move the image as you quickly move your head. Um, and it makes things like streaming possible. And it's, it's absolutely compatible with technologies like, you know, VRSS. I think to, to kind of add on to David and just th show my thumb again, uh, Kind of, it shows where your user has his or her attention, and you can use that for enhanced graphic. You can do that to compress the image being sent from Cloud XR to the headset. Uh, it can be if you are in an AR environment eventually, or even now, kind of, you want to do a lot of AI depending on where you are in the environment. You can't kind of compute on everything, but you should compute on where you have your attention. And that's kind of, you can have foveated AI compute, probably wouldn't trademark that, but uh, that's <laughs> one, one thing. And when it comes to 
uh, split rendering. I mean, cloud to have everything in the cloud in 5G is one thing, but just having tethered headsets, wirelessly tethered headsets, you need still to get the, the image from uh, the PC to the device. There you can do for via the transport as well. And when it comes to latency, uh, actually the hand control is, is probably the most difficult part to manage if you also include the action button for pressure. Whereas the eye tracking is relatively fast. So, so I think uh, on top of that, the brain is relatively easy to fool. I mean, that's all the magicians, that's their work. So you get away with quite a lot as long as you don't have flickering and strange artifacts. Uh, uh, so I think uh, there's a lot of nice uh, use cases where you can use foveation to kind of uh, get better utilization of resources, basically. You only get use resources where you're looking, whether it's bandwidth, graphics improvement, where I do AI or whatever. It's just the uh, it's a fundamental how we are built built uh, as a humans, and I think we should mimic that when possible. I was gonna say, I think shifting the the whole idea of utilizing foveation to help shift around where the compute lies um, is certainly something that there's an appetite for out there on the market. You know, I think we get HP, we get a lot of questions around, well, I love the power of having a PC VR driven experience, but I do want to be able to cut that six meter cable tether. So how can I have the best of both worlds? How can I have that mobility and ease of ease of use, but also with that same fidelity that only a high power compute can deliver? Um, you know, we, we get a lot of these questions around, well, how do I make this happen for multiple users in the co-located in the same space, um, you know, across location-based entertainment, again, training in a lot of simulation use cases as well. Um, so the potential of, you know, foveation um, in whatever form it, it may take um, in reducing requirements so that we can be shifting um, around where the compute lies um, certainly gives customers a lot more flexibility in the deployments. And I think it's something that is uh, definitely being asked for. Yeah, I was just going to mention, um, uh, Johan was, was talking about, you know, AI foveation. And um, if people have a few minutes on their hand, uh, you can Google peripheral metamers. Um, and there's uh, some, some really cool examples of them. Basically, um, as long as the periphery has the right statistical properties, right? Based on, you know, kind of the, the rods in your eye and what they view. Um, you can make all sorts of crazy things in the periphery uh, that don't resemble the actual periphery at all. Um, and as long as it has the right statistical signature, uh, your eyes, your brain is completely fooled, right? And so um, using AI to fill in those details so they have the right statistical characteristics um, but can be much, much lower bandwidth uh, in terms of, you know, foveated transport and as well as, you know, in terms of rendering. Yeah, and I was going to say, since we're on the topic of, of cloud uh, applications of VR, what would you guys say are the top applications that would benefit from foveation that are in the cloud or would leverage cloud computing? From my perspective, any application that where you send you rendered content in the cloud and that you need to send that content down to the to the display or the headset there you you, you can benefit from foveation yeah i think you know as so the one of the trends that we're seeing is is headsets continue to increase in fidelity right higher and higher resolution and um to to johan's point you know if you can um compress the image intelligently uh, um, thereby not losing any fidelity where the user is looking, uh, you can continue to, to feed all of those pixels. And the thing that enables that is gaze tracking, right? Is, is it, because if you can do that, you know where you have to maintain the fidelity. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that, oh, this application will benefit, that one won't. Um, it's kind of a necessary technology if you want to uh, feed the high resolution and high frame rates that that headsets are, are moving towards. Yeah, and to expand upon that point about the broad applicability of foveation, foveated rendering, um, 
you know, it, it's not just limited to a single type of VR deployment, right? When people think about, um, you know, cloud-based applications, a lot of times people's minds jump to, well, it, it is, you know, very much a server farm and maybe it's pushing over, you know, a lot of people are talking about the promise of 5G and and those more mobile wireless technologies, but it's also the, these kinds of deployments can also manifest themselves in kind of on-prem edge deployments. So having a set of workstations on site over a wireless network with the headsets. Um, that's another area where you know foveation can also play a huge role in reducing those. Uh, bandwidth requirements and making those kinds of deployments possible. So I think I think really the possibilities are truly endless with this. Johan, do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't have no. I think very much of it was was said. Uh, maybe the only uh, bandwidth also means money. Uh, in, if in five G, for example, you pay typically per bandwidth. So if you can reduce the bandwidth, there's money to be saved. Uh, so that's that's there are kind of some pure economic interests in, in, in that uh, as well. Great. Well, I think that kind of wraps up our discussion. Uh, I want to really say thanks to Henry, David and Johan for participating in the discussion. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. Uh, if anyone out there would like to provide us insights on a specific XR topic for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Uh, I'm at Anshel Sog. And we wanted to say thanks to Toby for sponsoring this podcast episode. And we hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week.